Hello everyone and welcome to Slash Film Daily for April 13th, 2018. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Film senior writer Ben Pearson, and joining me today are Slash Film weekend editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And Slash Film writer Chris Evangelista. Hello. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get into the news today. First up, uh, I, actually, I guess I hope the listeners enjoyed yesterday's episode, which was a special video game movie-themed episode in honor of uh, Rampage that's coming out, or is out, actually, in theaters right now. And uh, because of that, we missed, uh, we're, we're basically dealing with two days' worth of news uh, in today's episode of Slash Film Daily, so let's jump back in time a little bit to, I guess, later Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening when it was announced that John Krasinski has lined up his next directorial effort after A Quiet Place. It is a project called Life on Mars, and it is based on a short story by author Cecil Castellucci that, uh, I'll read the quote here from Hollywood Reporter, they said that the story centers on a woman who is among a handful of descendants of a Martian colony long abandoned by Earth following a cataclysm. The woman one day finds she can breathe the air on Mars, upending her world and that of her fellow colonists. And this project will reteam John Krasinski with the producers of A Quiet Place, who are Michael Bay, Brad Fuller, and Andrew Form, the guys who run uh, the production company Platinum Dunes. So we don't know uh, who is writing this script, and it's said that Krasinski is probably not going to star in this, but he is going to direct it, and I would not be surprised if he ends up taking a pass at the script, because he's written a lot of stuff uh, over the years including the things that he's worked on, like brief interviews with Hideous Men. He co-wrote uh, Promised Land from 2012, and also did a pass on the script for A Quiet Place. Chris, I don't think you've seen A Quiet Place yet. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. I'm waiting until uh, there are absolutely no crowds so I can enjoy the <laughs> film. <laughs> okay. Uh, but Brad, you have seen it. Is that correct? Yes, I did finally see it. Okay, so what did you think about A Quiet Place, and are you looking forward to John Krasinski's next directorial effort? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I if I had one complaint about the quiet, uh, quiet Place, it was that it was a little too short. I actually would have preferred to spend a little more time with those characters and in uh, this sort of post-apocalyptic world. Um, it was very well crafted, uh, very suspenseful, and I'm definitely excited to see what John Krasinski does next as a director. He's clearly got a knack uh, working behind the camera, and it should be uh, quite the career to keep an eye on. Uh, Chris, even though you haven't seen the film yet, does the concept interest you here? A, a Martian woman, or a, a woman who is in a, in a Martian colony who can suddenly breathe the air of that planet? Yeah, it sounds interesting, and I, I like the idea that he's he's sort of turning into this genre director, because before he was primarily just working with like indie sort of films, so I like the idea that he's sort of blossoming into this this genre filmmaker. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's go from a an up-and-coming director to somebody who is a longtime veteran of the industry directing a surprising project for Netflix. Chris, tell us about this one. Uh, yeah, so Martin Scorsese is going to direct a Second City TV uh, reunion special for Netflix. Uh, Second City TV is, uh, was a Canadian uh, sketch comedy show. It gave a lot of people their... Their start, like John Candy and Rick Moranis and Eugene Levy, you know, a lot of a very uh, 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 good group of funny people. And um, it doesn't it seems a bit surprising that Martin Scorsese would direct this. But uh, uh, Martin Short, who was also a member, um, has actually been talking about Scorsese uh, filming a reunion for a while now. Back in 2017, he actually mentioned that Scorsese sort of threw the idea around because he's he's fascinated with why uh this is a quote from martin short it says marty is fascinated with why some comedy is timeless when certain other comedy and and comedians have a short shelf life so this sort of sounds like it was like a a, a dream project for scorsese which i'm surprised about because i don't really associate him with comedy but this is a uh, something is happening now he's going to film it um it's going to be uh, taking place in may uh, it's going to be moderated by Jimmy Kimmel, and there's no word of when it's going to air on Netflix, though. So I've never seen Second City TV, but I, you know, just sort of paying attention to the comedy scene, that is one of those uh, shows and properties that pops up over and over again. It was, like, hugely influential for a ton of people. Brad, have you, I assume being a big comedy fan yourself, you've probably seen this show? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, SCTV isn't quite as re renowned as uh, a Saturday Night Live or anything like that, but it is 
Uh, definitely a show that a lot of people uh, got their start in who became famous comedians. Uh, Second City is a staple in the comedy world. Uh, even outside of SCTV, the Second City is a famous improv theater where a lot of people that went on to be on Saturday Night Live uh, and do great things in comedy got their start. And so a reunion like this for a, a cool comedy institution is great by itself. But the fact that someone like Scorsese is doing it is even more exciting. I can't wait to see uh, you know what they do and what they bring back, if anything, because hopefully this means we get to see Rick Moranis doing some stuff again because uh, this is where his the, the duo that him and Dave Thomas did, Bob and Doug McKenzie, uh, who went on to have, make, have their own movie, Strange Brew, uh, started. So hopefully they'll both be back and bring back those characters as well as some of the other memorable ones. Nice. Uh, I was wondering, because I haven't seen the show, was it particularly uh, stylishly directed? Do you think that Scorsese will be able to bring anything to this from a directing standpoint, aside from just sort of pointing the camera at funny people and letting them go? Uh, I mean, it was as stylish as any sketch show is when when uh, they're parading something that has a distinct style. Um, you know, it's it just depends on really what the sketch is about and what they're going for. Uh, the the style itself really just mimicked anything that was ripe for parody, whether it was you know parodying movie trailers or TV shows or, or things like that. So I, I wouldn't say that it overall had a distinct style, but having a filmmaker like Scorsese behind the camera certainly won't hurt at all. Excellent. Uh, let's go into another Netflix project. And Brad, why don't you tell us about this one? It's uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's new show. Yeah, so we all know Sasha Baron Cohen for playing characters like Borat and Bruno and Ali G. And, of course, he's also appeared in some other more traditional narrative comedies like Talladega Nights and The Dictator. But he's going to try his hand at some drama for a limited series on Netflix called The Spy. Uh, it's a six-episode series that is based on a true story, a real-life spy named Eli Cohen, no relation to the actor, who uh, he worked for Israel in the early 1960s and uh, went undercover in Syria. So uh, his the, the real man's involvement um, in the, the various conflicts and uh, actions that were going on during the time between Syria uh, and Israel were a big deal. Uh, apparently his work was integral in Israel's success in the Six-Day War, um, without diving into too much detail about what he did and spoiling the story, we'll kind of just leave it at that. But uh, this is an interesting turn for Sasha Baron Cohen because he hasn't really delved into dramatic fare too much. Uh, at one time, he was close to playing Freddie Mercury uh, in a, a Queen uh, um, biopic. And then, you know, he, Sweeney Todd, I guess you could say, is a little bit dramatic, but that's also a musical, so not straight up dramatic fare. So th this really is like kind of the first... Uh, straightforward drama that he's done. And what, what's cool about it is it's being written and directed by Gideon Raff, who created the Israeli series Prisoners of War, which is what inspired the Showtime series Homeland. Wow, so there's a lot of connections and a lot of uh, firsts in here. That's that's some interesting stuff. Chris, I mean, we've talked a lot about how Netflix is just like dumping stuff left and right on and really just like unleashing a torrent of new content. Does a dramatic turn from Sasha Baron Cohen sound like something that we'll be able to cut through the the muck and, and surface and actually interest you? Uh, I'm, I'll definitely give it a shot. It sounds interesting, but um, I do have a feeling it's, it's going to be another one of those Netflix titles that just gets buried under you know, the weight of everything else. Like I, it's one of those things I, I just know won't show up on that landing page when I log onto Netflix, even though it's going to be new I just, right. for some reason. <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, one of my favorite news stories of the past week, and that is some casting for It Chapter 2, or I guess potential casting anyway. Uh, Chris, tell us about the latest updates for the sequel. Oh, uh, yes, I'm very excited about this. Let this uh, prove everyone who accuses me of hating everything that I got very excited about this news. So there are some things I do <laughs> like. Um, so It uh, Chapter 2 is going to start shooting very soon, uh, I believe in July, in Toronto, which means they really got to start casting the the adult characters because I'm sure, as everyone knows, the second film is going to feature all the kids from the first film grown up and having to return to fight Pennywise again. So in the past, uh, Jessica Chastain was in talks to join the film as the adult Bev 
And now it's apparently she's uh, confirmed. She's definitely confirmed to join the film. And now James McAvoy and Bill Hader are in talks to join the film next. Um, McAvoy would play the adult version of Bill and Bill Hader would play the adult, the adult version of Richie. And this is really good casting. Um, for one thing, it shows that the film is really going after name actors. Um, you know, the, the first film didn't really have name actors. It was mostly kids. I think like Finn Wolfhard was like the biggest name in the film and Bill Skarsgård. So uh, that film, the first, it was such a hit. It's clear that they have a bit, uh, a little capital here to go after bigger names for the sequel. So this is, this is pretty cool. Brad, I know you have not read Stephen King's novel, but based on what you know from the movie, do, does this seem like good casting for you or to you, I guess? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, um, Jessica Chastain was always the perfect person for this role, and I like the idea of Bill Hader uh, expanding his horizons, doing things that aren't just comedies, uh, and casting him as uh, the kid that Finn Wolfhard played in the uh, first It is a pretty good move. I, um, James McAvoy is a name that I don't think really anybody thought of too much for Bill, but that's solid casting. He's, he's a great actor. Uh, he really throws himself into every role that he he takes on, so it should be interesting to see uh, them come together for the the sequel. I agree with everything you just said. I think McAvoy is one of those guys that when uh, I first saw the first it, my wife and I were talking about potential bill adult bills, and McAvoy came up because we had just seen Split, and at that point I was very high on James McAvoy and just thinking like, man, this guy can really do anything because I was so impressed with his performance there. And ultimately, I sort of decided that like maybe somebody else might be better at the role, but it's surprising that he is cast here because he's a kind of guy who does not necessarily strike me as somebody who is capable of playing or somebody who is appropriate for playing the bill that appears in the book, but he might be a really good version of the bill who showed up in the movie. If that makes any sense, Chris, what do you think about McAvoy as bill? Yeah, he would, he was nowhere on my radar for the part, but after I saw him, his name, you know, in the running for this, I was like, Oh, that's, really cool um uh, he's a very good actor um yeah the, the bill in the book is a very uh, uh he's got a bit of a paunch he's balding he's a he, you know he's he's a he's a writer basically and that doesn't really look like james <laughs> mcavoy but um like you said it, it could work for the, the version of bill that appeared in the film like i have no idea if the sequel is going to keep you know what all the characters grew up to be in the book i don't know if they're going to be the, like that in in the film because the first film even though it is very faithful to the tone of Stephen King's book, it does change a lot. So I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Yeah. And just to go back to what you were mentioning earlier uh, about the recognizable names, um, Justin Kroll, a reporter at Variety, actually tweeted something just a few hours ago that I saw and figured it was worth bringing up here. And he said, one thing I forgot to mention yesterday regarding these latest It 2 castings, while remaining adult characters are sure to be recognizable names, the likelihood that they will be on the level of Chastain, McAvoy, or Hader is not high. They're aiming for more character actor talent. So it seems uh, like those are going to be like the big three that they're going for. And then everybody else will still be recognizable, but maybe not quite on that tier. And I guess if people are looking for more suggestions, they can check out a an article that we wrote last year when the first It movie came out, where we actually tried to purposefully pick a, a lot of character actors and people like that that weren't full-blown A-list talent to fill out this cast so uh and i think jacob hall the managing editor of slash film actually picked bill Hader for richie so one of our choices has already come true so we'll have to see if if any others come true in the coming days still, and weeks i still got my fingers crossed for jerry o'connell as ben because that would be perfect that would be really great yeah uh all right so our next story is just something we can just touch on really briefly. I thought it was worth mentioning. Uh, Warner Brothers has cut final ties with Brett Ratner. So, Chris, explain the history of uh, Brett Ratner and that studio and what this latest move means. Oh, uh, yeah. So even though Brett Ratner hasn't really directed films in a while, he had a very lucrative uh, producing slash co-financing deal with Warner Brothers through his uh, his Rat Pack Entertainment. I mean, a lot of people might not realize this, but every time you see that Rat Pack logo in front of a film, that's Brett Ratner's company, and that appears in front of a lot of films. And so uh, last year, uh, several sexual misconduct allegations came out against Brett Ratner, and at the time, Warner Brothers, you know, they cut ties with Brett Ratner at the time, but they still had a bunch of films in the works 
that he was still, you know, attached to as a producer. So it seems like Rampage, the the Dwayne Johnson movie that came out this weekend, is the last of those films. So now that that's out, that's officially it for uh, Warner Brothers' relationship with Rat Pack. So I don't know if they're going to try and find someone else. I doubt it. Uh, I'm, well, Rat Pack is. I, I think this is pretty much the end of Rat Pack Entertainment. Yeah, I think, you know, the the this is one of those companies that would finance, like, I think their deal was something about financing, like, 25 to 30% of Warner Brothers uh, production slate, essentially. I mean, it was, like, it was a huge financial deal, and it's a big deal for Warner Brothers to actually sever these ties, because it proves that they're taking these allegations against Ratner seriously, and I think a lot of people in Hollywood probably have heard terrible stories about him for a long, long time, and the clamor among uh, you know, people in the industry has grown so loud that Warner Brothers just has decided that it's not a smart business move, even though there's a lot of money to be had in a partnership with Rat Pack. It's not a smart business move anymore to be associated with them anyway. So I just thought that was worth uh, pointing out from a, a quick business aspect here. I think all of us are probably like good riddance, right? <laughs> like, I don't think anybody's like really uh, shedding a tear for Brett Ratner at this point. But um, let's move on into uh, another quick item uh, about the business, and that is Fox Searchlight has launched a new TV division that will produce original TV shows and adaptations of movies. So it's interesting because Fox as a company is sort of, um, I guess, hovering under this looming Disney acquisition, right? We've talked a lot about that in the past few months, about how Disney is going to be purchasing a lot of... uh, entities within the 21st century Fox umbrella and Fox studio and Fox searchlight is are are two of those entities. So we've wondered what is going to happen to all that Uh, Fox searchlight has now created this new television division that is going to be a 360 degree hub for creative talent and broaden the variety of projects produced under the searchlight banner that's from the press release Uh, it says that they will produce original material as well as utilize the studio's rich library of feature films for adaptation in broadcast television cable and streaming with forays into scripted series limited series documentaries and more so what that essentially translates into is this new tv company is going to be mining through the library of fox searchlight movie properties looking for uh, things to adapt into TV shows. So I, I don't want to like completely put you guys on the spot here, but that's actually what I'm going to do right now. Are there any Fox Searchlight movies that you can think of off the top of your heads that would actually make uh, good TV shows? Like this, like uh, the Oscar winner, The Shape of Water is the most recent high-profile Fox Searchlight film. I personally think that would make a terrible TV show, but it is very high-profile and in the news right now, obviously. Uh, Are there any that you guys can remember over the years, any Fox Searchlight properties that you think might actually work well on the small screen? Brad, do you have any? I mean, I can see Shape of Water working if you turn it into, like, a dating game show where you have a woman picking between three different (laughs) fish creatures. But no, um, I actually did think about this once once this was announced, and I feel like a Super Troopers TV show w- could easily find an audience. Uh, Super Troopers 2 comes out next week, and that, that's that got a good uh, crowd of fans, and I bet you they would love to see um, those characters continue in some kind of comedy series. I could see that going to Netflix. Yeah. Um, gosh, what else is there? I, I feel like you could probably do something with 28 Days Later and finally – either do a follow-up story or maybe follow another story that's set in that same world. Mm -hmm. Um, Whip It would be another good one. Yeah, that was one that I suggested in the article that I wrote because I feel like it has a lot of potential to be like an episodic you know, journey through the, the world of, uh, roller hockey or ro- roller, uh, derby, roller derby. That's the title. Uh, yeah. Chris, do you have any searchlight productions that you think might make good TV shows? I don't know. I, 28 days later, like Brad says, pretty much seems like the best bet cause you know, the walking dead is so popular, but I don't know. I mean, they could do a, a 127 hours series where he cuts his hand <laughs> off every week, just every, <laughs> Every week he gets his hand stuck in something new and has to cut it off. Oh, not again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, my God. That would be great. All right. Uh, well, yeah, you guys can read more about that and all of these stories at SlashFilm.com. Let's move on to our next item, and that is the trailer for Incredibles 2. 
arrived earlier this morning. Uh, Brad, I think we're, I know you're probably not allowed to talk really about what you've seen yet because there's still an embargo, but you recently did a, a set visit for Incredibles 2. So I guess putting that aside and, and maybe teasing that for potential coverage on the show next week, what did you make of this new trailer? Yeah, um, this is a really cool trailer. They, uh, I will say that there's a lot of setup here um, from the footage that we saw at Pixar. They, they showed us in total about 35 minutes of the movie. It was the first 22 minutes, followed by three other scenes that were separate and uh, not in order necessarily. Um, so, yeah, there's um, the introduction here is pretty much what we knew as far as uh, Bob Odenkirk playing this character who wants to bring supers back into a favorable light in the public after they were sued and they were um, basically made illegal to demonstrate their superpowers and save people. And so now they're uh, creating this new initiative using Elastigirl to create faith in them and hopefully bring them back. Um, I think what's really what I'm most fascinated by is that they're not really giving away anything as far as what the villain's plot is in this movie and what he's trying to do. They And in fact... You don't even really see the villain in this movie until the very last shot where he, uh, the villain introduces themselves as the screen slaver. So uh, that's really interesting. Um, I will say that next week we have a lot of details coming from our visit to Pixar um, that will explain a little bit more about that villain as well as the new supers that you see on the poster that was released the day before the trailer came out. We've got details on that. We've got details on a whole bunch of stuff uh, that hasn't been revealed in the trailer and that hasn't been talked about just yet. So... Uh, the embargo for that lifts on April 16th, and we're going to uh, run a bunch of stories that day, and we've got a couple coming uh, leading up to the release of the movie in June as well. Excellent. Uh, Chris, what did you think of this trailer? Have you had a chance to check it out? I actually have not had a chance to watch it yet. I'm going to watch it uh, right after this podcast because I somehow forgot about it. Now I have to watch it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I thought, uh, I mean, The Incredibles was never really one of my favorite Pixar movies. I, I liked it fine at the time and have not revisited it in the way that I do with like the Toy Story films or anything like that. So I was like, okay, yeah, this looks fine to me. I, but I, I'm sure the people who have been, you know, passionately uh, anticipating and, and yearning for a sequel are probably pretty excited with what they're seeing here. So uh, we'll have much more about that movie next week. From one superhero movie to another, let's talk a little bit about Aquaman. Chris, tell us about the latest actor to be added to that film's cast. Uh, yeah, James Wan is currently doing some reshoots on Aquaman, and in these reshoots, he added a new actor, and that is Randall Park, who is on Fresh Off the Boat. Uh, he's playing a character named Dr. Stephen Shin, who I have no idea who that is because I don't really read the, the Aquaman comics, but I looked it up for the story, and apparently in the comics, he helped a young Aquaman develop his powers, and he's also uh, apparently, in the comics at least, friends with Aquaman's human father. So I don't know if that's going to carry over into the film or not but that's that's where it stands for now and um it's interesting because he's also uh randall park is also in a marvel movie coming up he is in ant-man and the wasp so there you have it they can coexist everyone yeah he's doing the old he's pulling a, a chris evans on us uh jumping back and forth right um so I, brad have you read any aquaman comics are you familiar with this character at all no, I, I'm. Uh, I haven't really dug too much into DC Comics as much as I have Marvel Comics, so I am not uh, any source of information as far as predicting who he might be playing or anything like that. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I have no idea who this character is either. So I'm. Just, I guess we'll just say that uh, I'm glad that Randall Park is in this movie because Randall Park is great, and uh, I'm always excited to see him pop up in anything. He seems to. Uh, basically just bring a little light to any project that he's a part of. So I guess we don't have to go too much further into that. I just wanted to let everybody know that he's going to be involved. I guess the idea that his character has been added in reshoots probably indicates that he's not going to have a huge role. But, uh, but you know, like I said, anytime his face pops up on screen, uh, it makes things just a little bit brighter. So let's move on to our final story of today's episode, and that is Westworld Season 2, the show comes back to HBO on April 22nd, but Chris, you've actually seen the first five episodes already, and you have a review up on SlashFilm.com that people can go there and read in great detail, but why don't you tell us, I guess, in, in a spoiler-free way, what you think about the first five episodes of Westworld Season 2? Uh, yeah, in, in my review, I tried as hard uh, to be... I, I, I made it as spoiler-free as possible, which was very difficult, because this is one of those shows where... 
even the most minute of details is considered by some to be a spoiler. But basically speaking, um, season two is great. It, it's bigger than the first season. It pretty much takes everything the first season did and improves on it uh, in every way. I mean, I liked the first season, but I felt like the first season had a lot of trouble with uh, – it tried too hard to be a, a, a quote-unquote mystery box show, if you will, where almost everything was you know, this, this big twist, this big secret. And I know some people like that. A lot of people – I mean – Everyone on the the, Re- the Westworld Reddit site seems to love that, but uh, I want a little bit more, and that's what I got from this season. Um, you know, there's still plenty of mysteries, there's still p- plenty of uh, puzzles to be solved, but uh, now that a lot of the exposition is out of the way from season one, it, it allows season two to open up a bit more and, and give the characters a lot more room to breathe. Like, especially like Ed Harris's character, because you know the first season. Ed Harris's character, the man in black, was very mysterious, and they waited to basically the last few episodes to tell us who he was. But now that we know who he is, season two gives his character a lot more to do, and he's a lot more uh, well-developed, which I really liked. Well, I have to say I am very excited about this now because the mystery box aspect of the first season was something that that was my least favorite aspect of the show. And it sounds like they're definitely putting that aside in a, in a much greater way and bringing the characters to the forefront, which is great news to me anyway. Uh, Brad, what do you think about this? Do you have any questions about Westworld season two? I mean, all I have are questions about <laughs> Westworld season two. Um, I'm made of questions when it comes to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just can't wait to see this season kick off. I've, I've actually kind of tried to stay away from finding out too many things about it. Yeah, even, you know, uh, I've, had to ri- I've had to write a few stories here and there about it, but I'm trying to stay in the dark about it as much as possible just so I can kind of enjoy it and uh, let it unfurl as it happens. Awesome. Well, yes, Westworld Season 2 premieres on HBO on April 22nd, so be sure to tune in for that. I'm sure we're going to be talking about it in great, great detail uh, over the course of the season. And that is going to bring us to the end of today's episode of Slash Film Daily. The podcast is published every weekday, bringing you the most exciting news from the world of movies and TV, as well as deeper dives into the great features you can find at the site. And subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Shoot us uh, feedback, questions, concerns, comments to peter at slashfilm.com. Be sure to leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention your email on the air. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes because that helped us out a ton. Tell your friends and be sure to spread the word about the show any way that you can. Before we sign off, let's tell people where they can find more of our work online. Brad, let's start with you. You can find me on Slash Film, writing stories all the live long days. You can also find me on Twitter at Ethan underscore Anderton, and you can check out my podcast, Go Flicks Yourself, on iTunes and other podcasting platforms. And Chris? Uh, I'm also at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at CEvangelista413. I am also at SlashFilm.com. You can find me on Twitter at Ben Pears. Peter Serretta, our normal host of this podcast, I believe will be back next week hosting the show again, so you can look forward to that. And thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time.